Mm, that's a problem when you have two screens. Now? Yes, good. Oh, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much for your patience. Yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, yeah. So maybe Deepak, you can introduce a few faculty members uh -huh. who are here, and then I will give a brief uh, uh, introduction about the speaker. Yeah. Yeah, Professor uh, Christina. So this is Deepak Roy from uh, Chemistry. So we have some other faculty members for this. So I just want to introduce you. Then maybe sure. later on they can have the interactions with you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Umes is here. Yeah, good afternoon. Afternoon. Yeah, it, I, I'm from a PC, that's why I cannot uh, start my video actually. I don't have my video facility yet. Okay, Dr. Amrindri is there, you can see that. Dr. Silva is there. Nice to meet you all. Thank you. And yeah, Bishru after the talk, we will have the interaction section. Yeah. So, Dr. Vishnu is there. Okay. So. Should I start? Hmm? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Vishnu. I have a HOD of our department. Yeah. Theoretical modeling in molecules and materials. Thank you. You can go ahead with the uh, talk first, then we can have it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe I will start the introduction of the speaker. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome, Professor Christina Bemelmans. So, as a part of uh, Acharya Prafula Chandra Ray Chemistry Lecture Series organized by the Department of Chemistry at IIT Indore, today our speaker is uh, Dr. Christina Bemelmans from uh, Hans Knoll Institute, Jena, Germany. She has done her habilitation in Leibniz Institute for Natural Product Research and Infection Biology, and Snow Institute, you know. And currently, she is appointed as a professor of biochemistry and the microbial metabolism at the University of Leipzig. So she did a diploma, so what we call in India as masters at RWTH Aachen, Germany, in 2006. And she joined for PhD dissertation in synthetic organic chemistry under the supervision of uh, uh, Professor Hans Ulrich Reiches at the Fry University, Berlin. So in three years, she completed her uh, PhD with the uh, best uh, grade, summa cum laude, at Fry University, Berlin. So after finishing her PhD, she did her postdoc at Tokyo Institute of Technology in Japan under the supervision of Professor Susugi for a year. Then she moved to Harvard Medical School and did a postdoctoral stint in the Department of Biomolecular Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology. And by 2013, uh, she became uh, the junior professor and she was doing her habilitation at the Leibniz Institute for Natural Product Research and Infection Biology and Snow Institute, you know. And now she is a full professor of biochemistry. So I know uh, Christina when she was a PhD student at Fry University, Berlin, when I was working as a humble fellow uh, with Professor Reisig. So we had a one year overlap, and then she completed her PhD working on complex natural product, SRISH-9. She did the total synthesis of SRISH-9. And because she is very experienced in doing total synthesis of natural products, in known institute, she was working on isolation of antimicrobial natural products. So mainly natural products are derived from microbes and eukaryotes. So it's very interesting to know that it's so difficult to isolate natural products from marine organisms and microbes. But she was very successful in isolating many of the natural products, developing methodology, and also studying the biological activity. 
She is also a member of famous European Microbiological Societies and also International Union of Microbiological Societies. She received many awards, to name a few. She got the Proctor Campbell Award from RWTH Aachen and also Lecturer Award from Fons der Chemischen Industry. And uh, latest in 2021, she also received a Young Scientist Award for Natural Product Synthesis. So with this brief introduction, I would like to welcome Professor Christina to begin her talk on chemical biology and their importance in natural products. Thank you so much for this very kind introduction. And yeah, PhD time is long time ago. We were pretty young that time. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I will talk today about projects which I have started during postdoc time and then continued and developed at the HKI Institute and which we are now pursuing in Leipzig uh, further, um, where we will move to most likely in summer this year. So that's why we, I still have my HKI logo here because my group is still working at the Institute at the moment. <clears throat> so I will talk today not only about total synthesis of microbial natural products, but of course also on um, why they are important and how we can isolate them. Um, and first of all, you might ask yourself why a chemist trained in organic chemistry is interested in microbes and natural products um, or the function of natural products. And that is because these microorganisms are essential for our daily life. They are important for our digestive system. They are important for our mood. So if we have the wrong microbial community in our gut, we might get depression or anxiety, so it's all related. Um, and so a good, healthy microbiome is important. Then, uh, of course, they are also important for development of um, organisms, especially in the marine environment. And uh, these microbes produce compounds which are important for the development. And the question is now, how do these microbes look like? And here are, uh, for example, these uh, compounds, natural products, which we isolate and which in which we are interested in. And these compounds are secreted by the microbiome and have the specific function within microorganisms, but also the specific function within the host. So our um, digestive system, for example, receives these compounds and can process information as do other animals as well. And we are interested in on this, um, these functions of the natural products. But for that, you need, of course, first to isolate the compounds or even synthesize them to be able to manipulate the system. So the mission of my group was using symbiotic systems and to understand the structural diversity and function of natural products. And by that, immediately, immediately you're also getting attracted by their biosynthetic origin, so how nature makes them, and if we can use this knowledge actually to exploit it for drug discovery. So we try to basically approach it from different sides, but it also means we need uh, expertise and um, experiments from all sides, not only from organic chemistry, but also from the microbial side. So we choose two model systems because in the beginning I was very hesitant to work on human gut microbiomes, for example, which are very, very complex. So I chose a little bit simpler systems in the insect world, but where we can use the knowledge still for human welfare and a system which is like, uh, slightly related to the human microbiome um, and related to morphogenesis. And I will today not talk much about the termite system as we mostly focus on chemistry today. But if you are interested, you're very welcome to watch our YouTube video on the termite fungi culture. And basically it shows how we um, harvest the system, how we get the samples. It might be very interesting to watch actually how we collect samples from the environment um, and how we process the samples. And of course, uh, also all our collaborators show what uh, they contribute to the whole overall story. Um, and as Venkatesh mentioned, we isolated quite a, a few natural products of different complexity and different origin, for example, like very small indole compounds, but they are quite essential in certain symbiotic systems. 
Um, we also isolated a couple of peptides, especially cyclic peptides, which have antimicrobial property and particularly antibacterial properties. Also pigments like these rupturolones, which are of very reddish color, or these polyene structures, which are very well known for their antibacterial and antifungal activity. Uh, we did that in most cases by using co-culture systems where we cultivated the isolated organisms together with others or together with insects, and then pursued a high resolution metabolomic analysis to track down which of the natural products are produced in these interactions, and especially which of the metabolites are induced, meaning which are only produced um, when they are in co-culture, when they experience different partners, like here shown in this yellow dot. This compound is only produced when the strain really interacts with another strain. Um, and that is the key point because we want to know which products or which natural products are produced in the interaction, meaning where do they have the, uh, which of those derivatives might have the most important function. <clears throat> this was a very successful approach and I think many people are following up on this one now uh, because you can do a much more targeted approach on natural product isolation. Um, one example I want to show here um, is that we also used the genomic information of these bacterial strains we isolated, where we pursued basically an analysis of the genomic capacity of a strain and compared it to its closest neighbors or closest uh, relatives. And uh, as you can see here of the overlying uh, colors, they seem to be quite identical, the different strains. So each color represents one strain, but one strain differed in just one spot of the uh, of the genome, and this one encoded for a secondary metabolite-related gene cluster, meaning you see here basically the genes which encode for the enzymes, which then produce the compound of interest. And we were interested in this compound because when you look at the gene structure arrangement and what it basically tells us from the prediction, it was predicted to be of a very small structure, but of um, which should carry a functional moiety like this shown here. It's a vinylogous amino acid. And these substructures are known to be um, active moieties in um, protease inhibitors. So there are a couple of natural products known which have this moiety and there are very, very active uh, protease inhibitors, often in the uh, nanomolar range. So we thought, okay, this might be a very important compound for the strain and most likely also uh, an unknown compound because we were not sure what the tail here shown in black might look like and what the amino acid might be. So um, we then used a comparative metabolomic analysis um, because the strain uh, seemed to produce this compound all the time. So in this case, not in interaction, but it was seemed to be very important for the strain in general. So that then we compare basically which metabolites are secreted by those strains which do not have this gene cluster and by those by this strain which has a gene cluster. And uh, in the very right side you can see here in the color code the strain which encoded this gene cluster in black uh, produced a metabolite which was not present in the other strains in the red and blue one. So, and then uh, you can immediately check, okay, which molecular mass might this peak have, uh, and when it's produced, uh, it was produced, as I said, most of the time, but with a peak time around three uh, to seven days. So we knew that we had to cultivate the strain for about a week. Uh, and then we knew also the mass uh, fragments from, from this peak. Uh, so we could do a, a targeted um, MS guided isolation approach. And interestingly, the isolated structure really matched, at least in the core structure, the predicted um, structure. So that made NMR analysis very simple. Um, the uh, amino, uh, amino acid which was incorporated was arginine, which is very interesting because this is a very um, polar amino acid. So it can, or it's likely uh, to be very soluble. If you think of drug applications, uh, it has also a lipid tail. <clears throat> which was only an octanoic acid. Uh, and this molecule basically matched also the predicted pathway uh, in all its um, details. So what can we do with the structure now? It's very simple. Um, of course, we had quite a challenging time in isolating the compound, not because we 
we ha didn't had any target, but because the strain was an anaerobic strain uh, and that requires a lot of technical, um, let's say, or it poses a lot of technical questions. And after cultivating of about 100 liters of anaerobic culture, we got one milligram out of it. But one milligram of compound is enough for structural elucidation, but not enough for testing, or at least for suitable testing. So that means once we had uh, <clears throat> the structure uh, elucidated, we immediately pursued the uh, synthesis of this compound because of its simplicity. And we basically used just simple peptide chemistry to approach this uh, synthetic um, problem by basically just coupling uh, the fatty acid to the amino acid and then coupling in the next step the vinylogous amino acid to the growing chain. But uh, this one looks very simple. It's triple protected um, arginine or vinylogous arginine, but this was actually the synthetic challenge to generate. Um, and at the end, we synthesize it out of uh, lysine and not of arginine itself because we needed an FMOC BOC protected version of this amino acid to pursue with the coupling uh, reaction uh, at least in some success. Um, <clears throat> so simple COMO activation resulted then basically in the protected version of the barnazine compound. And the <clears throat> problem with arginine you always have is that once you remove the BOC protecting group, it might cyclize actually um, and give you a lactam derivative, which we also had as a problem. So at the end, only um, TFA deprotection and immediately treating with esterase to remove the ester help to obtain the final compound and not perfect yield, but for the challenges we had with 50% was sufficient. Uh, and with that, we actually had enough compounds and enough derivatives to test, and we uh, basically verified that this is a roughly nanomolar active uh, compound. And once we remove all the double bonds here from the vinylux amino acid and the um, fatty acid, it becomes inactive, which indicated towards a likely 1,4 um, micro type addition to the target. <clears throat> As we were not satisfied with the normal peptide coupling strategy, we also developed a second approach where we basically synthesized the vinylogous amino acid on resin using a phosphorus agent coupled to CTC resin, where we then pursued the peptide coupling uh, in seven consecutive steps, uh, which also gave us barnazine uh, and, and much more flexibility uh, regarding the synthesis. So we were able to more quickly generate a couple of um, uh, amino acid derivatives uh, and um, modifications in the fennel ring, which uh, were just faster to approach, not because it gives better yield, but just it was much faster to, to obtain. And we were interested in testing these compounds. And at the moment, we are working on the slicing derivatives, which show to be the, have the best uh, solubility um, activity ratios. So um, with that, I actually just showed you briefly um, what we can get out of microbes isolated from certain habitats. But these approaches, um, if I just go back, these approaches are driven by the genomic information and interaction studies. Um, <clears throat> however, during postdoc time, um, we also got interested in compounds which induce a very interesting phenotype in certain organisms. So we were interested in transformations which are called uh, morphogenesis. And the simplest thing you might imagine during morphogenesis is, for example, the development of a butterfly. The butterfly starts basically from an egg, it develops into a larvae which explores habitats, it feeds and develops then seasonal dependent into a puppy, which then transforms into the butterfly. So it undergoes several morphogenic steps, but the steps are more or less driven by the season temperature and nutrient availability. And this is true for many terrestrial insects, but this is not true for marine um, habitats. So in marine habitats, it's slightly different. In marine habitats, bacteria are producing natural products which induce this transformation, meaning the development from one step to the next step. And 
uh, in um, actually you can find it in almost any marine, let's say, um, strain from different phyla or even different families or different genera, which you, which are all distributed across the phylogenetic tree. And if you see here, the orange dots are um, basically species which undergo metamorphosis, so meaning you can find it everywhere. And in almost every phyla, you can also find the effect that bacteria are involved in this morphogenesis. So this is just a phenotype you observe. But the question is now, what do the bacteria do or which natural products do they produce to induce the cell differentiation? Because morphogenesis requires the whole transformation of a body, meaning inducing apoptosis, inducing the whole uh, uh, change in the transcriptome of a cell. So a huge step an essential step for these organisms. So, and we were interested in what these natural products look like, which induce these transformations. And if you want to have a look on all the ecology behind these um, uh, stories, you, you know, again, <laughs> happy to watch a second YouTube video related to uh, the marine organisms, Hydroctinia chinata, where you can see where we collect all the stuff and all the organisms. But here, of course, in the talk, I just want to show you uh, the chemistry behind it. So, and the chemistry started when we looked at a protist. It's uh, a marine organism living as a single cell uh, since basically almost three or four hundred million years, if not longer. So, it's existing since the early times. And this one feeds on bacteria. So, it eat, eats up bacteria. And it does so by forming a wolf pack. It does not feed much as a single cell, but it transforms into these 50 colony shaped um, rosettes where they basically feed on prey bacteria much more efficiently. So they suck in everything they find. And this transformation is induced by the prey bacteria. So they sense, uh, basically they sense the prey bacteria uh, because they secrete signals. Um, unfortunately, I mean, it's for disadvantage for the prey bacteria, but they are sensed by the predator. And um, this transformation, this rosette form, is a kind of morphogenesis, at least if you ask a biologist. It's a huge debate, but we just recall it here for the sake of time that this one is a morphogenic process. So, and after three years of work, two postdocs and 100 liters of microbial fermentation of this nice looking bacterium here, um, this is a prey bacterium, uh, we found two types of lipids. Uh, or they are related, of course, from the same family, um, which induce the exact phenotype we observe when we treat the predator with bacteria. And these signaling molecules, you might know, these are basically sphingolipids, cell signaling molecules in our every, basically our cells in our body. Just in the bacterium, and they produce derivatives which have a sulfonyl group because they need to, I'd say it's an adaptation to the marine salty environment. But otherwise, the sphingolipid quark stru structure is the same as we have in our cell signaling uh, molecules. We call them RIF1 and RIF2 because they're just structurally different in terms of the hydroxy group here shift. Uh, the double bond is included in RIF2, but otherwise, the core structure is the same. And these compounds, when you treat this predator with the compounds, it immediately undergoes this rosette formation, meaning these are the signaling molecules which are secreted by the bacterium um, and cause basically the cell death, um, if you want to say so, because they're getting eaten up. And they do, do it in a dose response curve. So if you titrate in nano atomolar concentrations, these compounds, the cells which transform into rosettes uh, are increasing. So it's a dose dependent curve. And what is also interesting is that the single compounds are not as efficient as if you mix the compounds. So it's, you get the highest response if you mix both RIF1 and RIF2 compounds and you get almost 30% of all cells to transform. And uh, the biologists, are, I mean, the, um, they are now working on what changes are actually induced. And I can tell you that the cell, the whole transcriptome of one single cell changes to form this multicellular aggregation. So it's a very important effect on the cell signaling cascade in the cell. Um, what's also important, and that counts for many, many um, natural products also 
uh, in our gut environment, uh, the cell, the signaling molecules in our our gut microbes uh, secrete that lipids like those phospholipids um, enhance effects. So they are often very beneficial. And we saw the same effect here. So once uh, this LPE we call the lysophospholipid is also co-secreted, uh, the effect uh, basically goes up the roof and you get up to 100% of induction um, into this uh, rosette shape form. So the message I want to tell you here is that it's often very important that you consider um, compound mixtures, even of two types of compounds, um, because that basically reflects the phenotype you observe when you investigate um, uh, the, the bacterial strain as such. If you break it down to single compounds, you get much less of an effect, as these often interact synergistically. <clears throat> so now you might question yourself, okay, these are very lipophilic molecules, they have flock P's of around seven to nine, uh, so they are not soluble at all. That's true, because the bacterium cannot help itself, it basically secretes these compounds in so-called outer membrane vesicles, because these compounds form micelles immediately. If they are not shed as outer membrane vesicles, they even then reorganize themselves to form smaller uh, single layered uh, vesicles or layers and then basically get uh, absorbed. And that's how they are transported by the uh, bacteria. Um, we also looked at the diversity of these uh, sphingolipids in bacteria and they're quite abundant. You can find uh, very dominant uh, compounds like sulfobuxin D and B, which are the most simple derivatives here uh, on the bottom and black, which have less functionality in the backbone, and the more functionalities are included, like the hydroxylated versions, they are uh, less abundant. So that means also that there are some regulations regarding their biosynthesis, which we do not know yet, unfortunately. But they are very abundant in, um, across all sphingolipid producing bacteria. Um, then you might ask yourself, what does a bacterium have? from being getting eaten. So of course nothing, because it's basically it's uh, the death of the species. So it also developed countermeasures. And these are very interesting if you want to look now as uh, in, the, in the signaling cascades. And the bacterium produces at the same time the red compounds shown here, which are um, inhibiting the effects of the green compounds. And of course, depending on how much of the inhibitor it produces, it can basically prevent getting sensed. And we could find these compounds also by um, activity guided isolation. And it's also interesting that this one is very much structurally related to the uh, sphingolipids and likely um, a biosynthetic shunt product. Um, but that is a topic we are currently exploring. Um, those compounds which are less functionalized also act as a kind of uh, inhibitor um, basically as a competitive, competitive inhibitor. So the bacterium has some measures, um, especially in regard of the ratios of inducing versus non-inducing compounds, or inducing uh, versus inhibiting compounds. <clears throat> so we made use of this information because we wanted to track down the cell signaling cascade and we wanted to uh, verify also the structure activity relations. So we had to basically design synthetic strategies towards this inducing compounds and the inhibitors. And this is now the chemistry I want to show you. So first of all, we were interested in synthesizing RIF2 because we wanted to uh, know what the stereochemistry in the sixth position is, and we not wanted to know how far the hydroxy group can go in the chain uh, to, to basically lose or increase activity. And sphingolipid synthesis, you normally cut here on the back uh, and the peptide um, or in a, the amide functionality um, to get the <clears throat> fatty acid. Uh, in this case, you would need an alpha hydroxylated fatty acid. And you normally start using Ghana aldehyde, which has the advantage for normal sphingolipids that you have the hydroxy group in C1 position but has a disadvantage for sulfonyl sphingolipids that you need to modify this position C1 later on. Anyways, so we started first with the Ghana aldehyde, uh, thought of a nucleophilic addition to uh, the aldehyde or stereoselective uh, addition to the aldehyde, and then later a couple um, 
the captain core structure with the fat required fatty acid. Um, so in that course, we thought that we also want to have a short approach to alpha hydroxylated fatty acids. So there are many synthetic strategies, but we thought of a new one um, just to give us some modularity to the system. Uh, and we made use of the 2016 published decarboxylative coupling strategy by Baran and co-workers, where you basically use um, a free carboxylic acid a zinc reagent and nicolate catalyst, including some ligands, to um, break radically this bond, so to form a radical, uh, which then couples with a zinc reagent to give a CC bond. Uh, and this worked very well, for example, for this protected malic acid derivatives or the tip protected uh, acid derivative where you can selectively address this uh, free carboxylic acid and couple it with the respective zinc reagent to the required um, fatty acid, which is then differently uh, protected. Uh, the protection then resides in either, for example, the TIPS protected uh, alpha hydroxylated acid or um, the free acid. And this synthetic strategy, although the yield overall in the coupling step is not that high, it's anyway not that high also in the original publications, but it was at least a very, very fast approach. And this was also a very important intermediate because once you have a double bond, you can do basically everything what you want. Um, then we had to synthesize the CAP9 core structure, and we also had in mind to synthesize different derivatives regarding the Zin antistereochemistry here. Uh, so we first synthesized basically zin cap 9 bases and later on the normal anti cap 9 bases just to have more uh, derivatives at, at hand to, to test structure activity relations. Um, to introduce the C6 uh, hydroxy group uh, protected version here, we required uh, uh, the uh, propagylic or protected propagylic alcohol here which we could use as building blocks, for example, in a circulation uh, reaction um, using Schwarz reagent and zinc. Um, if you use uh, the Schwarz reagent and zinc, zinc under these conditions, you get a preference for the zin uh, diastereomere. If you change later on to lithium reagents, you get the preference for the anti diastereomere. Um, with both of them in hand, we then basically uh, pursued the synthesis. Um, however, uh, you have to consider that at the final molecule, we need uh, the double bond, um, which you get with uh, the uh, using the hydrocircanation approach. If you just go back one more uh, the slide again, if you use the hydrocircanation approach, you, you basically generate the double bond instantaneously due to the addition of the Schwarz reagent. But if you use lithiated reagent, um, you require an additional step. So um, we decided to use the propagylic alcohol um, using uh, just deprotection with and uh, just uh, lithiation with enboli, but that would give you in the first step uh, still the propagylic alcohol. So we had to reduce uh, the double bond using, for example, red al, which is very straightforward because um, you generate a free hydroxy group here at this position, which can direct red al to uh, the trans to re to induce a trans uh, reduction use uh, with the aluminium reagent. Um, <clears throat> so in both approaches, we then had the cap nine base basically at hand, which then required the protection and deprotection um, of the um, uh, here of the head group. So we had to deprotect bark, but also to protect the secondary alcohol. And then we found that by treating uh, or treating the compound with TBS triflate uh, and subsequent treatment with TB, uh, TMS triflate resulted first in the protection of the secondary alcohol and then TMS induced cleavage of the BOC uh, group. And that was very useful for us because that is a very one, it's a very easy one pot procedure. Um, with the TBS protected uh, CAP9 base, we then proceeded just simply, simply uh, with peptide chemistry, coupling the fatty acid to yield the uh, sphingolipids, which then had to be modified in a C1 position uh, using Mitsunobu um, <coughs> conditions, using thio, uh, protected thio acid, um, which then gives basically the protected thio derivative. 
Now, now, come, now comes a big challenge and which we were working on quite some time. The problem is <clears throat> you need to oxidize this tile in the presence of this uh, allylic protected alcohols. And the best case without deprotecting these alcohols because otherwise the double bond isomerizes. And none of the oxidation methods we tried um, on free or uh, free or protected tiles worked. Uh, all of them basically removed the TBS groups and caused isomerization. So that was a big drawback. Um, so at that time, we then thought, why should we actually reduce the triple bond uh, from in the beginning? We can also do that at a very later stage um, because the propergylic alcohols might be more stable than the allylic alcohols. So we basically had to synthesize a different derivative of the caponine base where we uh, reduced uh, propergylic ketone um, using Noyori catalyst uh, transfer hydrogenation conditions, giving either the R or S uh, stereoisomer and comparable yields. And then we kept the triple bond and did not reduce it at this stage to the double bond just basically as a kind of protecting group, if you want to say so. Um, and with that, we proceeded the whole synthetic approach again, meaning deprotection here of the Ghana, uh, uh, fragments of the Ghana aldehyde or the acetyl, coupling chemistry again with the alpha hydroxy fatty acid to give the fully protected uh, sphingolipid at uh, having a free C1 position. Again, uh, Mitsunobo uh, conditions to introduce the sulfur. <clears throat> and this one worked quite well. So when you have still the triple bond, these kind of uh, the, the alcohols are less lay by uh, to acidic conditions. So you can deprotect and oxidize the sulfur in the presence of TBS and TIPS. Sometimes one of the protecting groups cleaves off, but most of them remain. And then you can basically uh, use um, just longer reaction conditions. And then one of the groups uh, basically is cleaved off. And once that is detected, you treat the compound mixture with red L, and this one reduces you the um, triple bond. Um, this is, um, you, you have to carefully monitor the reaction conditions. So the overall yields about these three steps is very, very low. And it's certainly, um, possible to optimize that one, but we were happy to just have the compound because our approach was that we need the compound for testing and verifying the stereochemistry first before we start to optimize any further steps. And luckily, all of the uh, NMRs we obtained from the synthesized compounds, as shown here on top, match those ones from the isolated compounds in proton and carbon NMR. We then also pursued an unselective biomimetic approach using selenium oxide, treating the isolated compounds of Abaxin F with this uh, oxidizing agent. And this one basically oxidizes unselectively the allylic position in about 10 to 15 percent, giving you an RS uh, mixture. And this one we could also use uh, to compare the NMR data. So on the top, you see, for example, the mixture of RNS obtained from this biomimetic approach. And on the bottom, you see the NMRs or the proton NMRs of isolated and uh, synthetic compounds. And this way we could basically determine um, the stereochemistry of the isolate and also use the compound of compounds, of course, later on for biotesting. So with that, um, this is a very long story, but it gave us much insights into um, the structure diversity um, of this uh, sphingolipids. Um, but at the same time, in parallel, we actually looked at this inhibitor because we thought that we could use this compound much easier, or we could synthesize the compound uh, in an easier way and also um, uh, and you, uh, introduce here bifunctional probes for proteomics. Um, and in the first synthesis, which we still did at, uh, when I was postdoc in 2015, we finished this study. The synthetic approach was very simple, but also not very efficient and certainly not modular in terms of what we can do uh, by introducing here fluorescence probes or bifunctional probes. Uh, so it was just reduction, uh, 
dry hydroxylation using AD mixes and then substitution reactions. And again, you can see the yields of the substitution reactions here and C1 are not very efficient. So yields were not good and certainly the most important part, it was not modular at all. So that's why we again use this decarboxylative uh, alkylation strategy um, because we could, in, we could easily introduce model, uh, or it was so modular that we could easily introduce functional probes to it. Uh, here you can see the compound again and the decarboxylative coupling uh, approach, which will require a retrosynthetic cut here, uh, leading us again to an unsymmetric diacid uh, where we need a free acid for carboxylative uh, coupling reactions. Um, and that interest that really worked. So starting from tartaric acid, uh, in three steps, we could desymmetrize uh, tartaric acid, giving us directly in C1 position the oxidized sulfur and in four position the carboxylic acid, which we need to basically couple or remove and couple. And again, slightly optimized conditions using zinc reagent and nickel um, catalysis yielded us um, in a highly diastereo selective fashion uh, the core structure with almost any tail we wanted. It should, of course, tolerate the conditions, but as mentioned, you could introduce double bonds, um, you could introduce amines, alcohols, and so on, and you can do almost any chemistry with that. So after a uh, reductive deprotection of the sulfur, you get actually the free uh, compound. So reduce the step to six steps, overall yield was 60, uh, 30% and certainly uh, including modularity. Um, now comes the challenging part. It's basically what can we do with these compounds? And um, we could, for example, track the compounds by introducing a, um, fluorescence probes. So you could see how they are basically taken up by the organisms where they land. So they land in food worker oats and getting then transported also into other vacuoles. Um, and what we then did introduced basically a photoreactive probes, uh, which we could use for click reaction and biotin based enrichment analysis to track down the binding targets in the um, bacteria, but also within uh, the chronoflagellates. And this is currently under basically under analysis um, to find out what the binding partners or the most likely binding partners are compared to unspecific binding. Um, so with that, um, this is basically currently the status quo. We are currently evaluating the binding partners of the inhibitors um, and doing competitive and, um, assays with uh, inducing compounds to understand how these interaction also uh, evolve. Because once you know the binding partners, you can uh, more or more in detail understands the signaling cascade. Um, and this leads us also to a very interesting topic of the biosynthesis of sphingolipids in bacteria. So this is currently a very hot topic um, um, in different groups. And um, because the biosynthesis, which was assumed for humans, is actually to slightly or totally different in bacteria and fungi. So this biosynthetic pathway, which was assumed or is shown here, where you start basically with an acetylester zerine to give ketiosphingonin, um, which is then reduced to sphingonin derivatives. This is true for humans, but this is uh, not true for bacteria and also not true in some cases for fungi. Um, the hypothesis or original hypothesis, which was out in the literature, that this one works with cystic acid. Um, to give basically this uh, cup nine or cystic acid containing cup nine core structure. This is currently under evaluation and it's also not that certain that this, that there are so strong homologies that might actually have uh, evolved independently. So I'm pretty sure here there are some steps which will have to be revised in future. Um, and as we are talking about sphingolipids, uh, sphingolipid biosynthesis uh, is important in humans. Um, and the inhibition of this biosynthesis is also of, of pharmacological importance. So at the same time, we were also looking at certain inhibitors of this biosynthesis um, to approach it basically from different angles. 
And a lot of fungi produce sphingolipid in, uh, biosynthesis inhibitors because they want to modulate uh, the growth of other fungi and bacteria. And the most, one of the most well-known compounds are the sphingofungins, where you can already see a structural resemblance to sphingolipids, but they do not have here the fatty acid uh, attached to it, and they have much more functionalities uh, at the head group. So for several reasons, we were then interested in the synthesis of these compounds, and now you can guess already. If you synthesize sphingolipids using decarboxylated coupling strategies, why not synthesizing the inhibitors as well? using a similar type of approach. And <clears throat> here, Lucas uh, basically, uh, Luca uh, took the challenge and he thought to make the shortest synthesis of these inhibitors um, yet reported. And for that, he used the very same approach he used as for the other synthetic approaches. But just you have to make, be careful about the cuts you make. Um, here, <clears throat> he used um, basically two cuts, uh, one the decarboxylated cross-coupling uh, step here and the methacetyl step, because the same procedures which worked before should also work here. So once you have a double bond, you can extend uh, the chain as you wish. So for that, you need to um, synthesize this <coughs> protected alanine derivative. And again, you could use tartaric acid as a chiral building block uh, to introduce the stereochemistry required here, these positions three and four. And um, to cut also a long story very short, he managed to uh, synthesize the sphingofungins uh, using a very short approach. Uh, again, he started from this unsymmetric tartaric acid. So you see the parallels to the previous ones. Um, he just had to modify this um, acid slightly different because you needed to, you have more functionalities to it. So by just transforming this uh, acid basically into a vinerib amide and then elongation using vinyl mag magnesium bromide and reduction, you obtain this elongated tartaric acid derivative where you have here an allylic uh, alcohol and the double bond which is required for chain elongation. Um, <clears throat> then this is basically now one um, carboxylic uh, one carboxylic acid transformed. Now you need to release a second carboxylic acid for the cross-coupling reaction. This is simple by uh, saponification. Uh, you basically obtain the free acid, which you can then cross-couple uh, with this adimine, which was also reported at least uh, uh, as a principal possibility uh, by Baran in 2018 or 2019. I think two, twice it was reported, but not for this composition. So we knew it should work in, in principle. And with some <clears throat> say modification in the uh, <clears throat> solvent and additives, uh, he obtained actually the coupled product and pretty good yield. So you see here the carboxylic acid uh, is removed. It's a, a radical cleavage here at this position, and you couple it in a radical coupling reaction with this <clears throat> adenine. Uh, and you obtain it in a stereoselective fashion depending on the chirality of uh, the protecting group or auxiliary in this case, actually. Um, if you change <coughs> some of the conditions, um, you can also obtain immediately the acetyl group here in this position, um, because this one is actually a, a group which is required in one of the string of functions and the yields are comparable. So you, we can produce uh, the the core structure with an acetyl group at this position or TBS group. Um, in the next step, uh, you can you make use of the double bond here. For example, when you use the acetyl protected um, um, version, uh, you just use grub secondary generation catalyst, catalyst uh, and obtain uh, the required, or the, the, actually the core structure of the swing of function and okay-ish yield. Uh, because you always obtain some of the starting material. So the Grubbs methesis on this very complex compound with the allylic alcohol and in a proximity are not that efficient, but you can at least isolate the starting material. Uh, the second challenge was the deep protection, and um, you, we require the deep protection of all of these groups in the presence of the acetyl group. 
And this was only achieved with uh, bortetrachloride, so tetrachlor, or tetrachloride. And <clears throat> uh, that also in a time dependent fashion, so you really have to monitor the transformation. Um, but in one step, basically, you get sphingofungin C acetate protected, which you can then also transform in sphingofungin B or uh, A, depending on what you actually need. Um, you can also, of course, deprotect the acetate group, then the yields are much higher. Um, to get uh, sphingofungin C um, because, because the acetyl group actually moves over time to the more stable amide group. So this is also a natural transformation, actually. Um, nevertheless, uh, depending on the conditions and using this core compound, uh, we could uh, synthesize, I think, eight natural derivatives and a couple of functionalized derivatives, which we are now using also for fluorescence um, studies. So you can imagine, depending on what substrate you use for the Grabs uh, catalysis, uh, you can modify basically anything you want here at the end. <clears throat> so that is still ongoing, um, but this was one of the, or is the shortest uh, synthetic approach yet to uh, this complex uh, natural products. Um, and with that, actually, I hope I could show you uh, on the synthetic side uh, that we use symbiotic or microbial interactions to understand the structural diversity that <clears throat> is not dependent on a certain group of compounds. It's really that depending on the interaction, you get what they produce. So we are prepared to structurally elucidate any type of compounds um, and try to understand the function of these compounds within the interaction. Um, we try to use the synthetic, biosynthetic um, data, and if it's not possible, uh, we try to synthesize these compounds um, because sometimes it's just a question of what is faster. So biosynthetic engineering also takes quite a lot of time um, as does synthesis. So it's often the approach that we do both approaches with one or more aims. Um, and in some cases, synthetic approaches are faster and some the biosynthetic studies are faster. Uh, but at the end, we want to understand the functions. So we, that's why we do it in parallel. Um, so with that, uh, I have to thank the people, especially um, Luca. I talked today about his study. He is here in the back. He's now finishing his PhD. And Daniel um, and also Maya, who worked on the Barnazine story, for example. So um, they basically did all the synthetic work and uh, these fundings uh, paid for, for their salary and for everything else. So with that, um, I'm happy to answer any questions and looking forward also to talk to you in detail. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Cretino, for your wonderful and complex lecture and so the lecture is open for questions it's too complex and we just go back <laughs> so thank you know? for a very nice uh, talk uh, the work uh, yes uh, somebody I mean, uh, not from organic synthesis background, so, but you uh, explained it very nicely. Thank you. Uh, I was just uh, curious, it has, you know, from a synthetic point of view, how challenging is this? Because I see many chiral centers and during the, uh, uh, some preparations, do you feel, uh, do you encounter racemization or something like that? and isolation of different enantiomers. Uh, How difficult yeah, so, um, I, I can very uh, basically uh, <laughs> showcase the problems um, with this one compound, which took us very, very long time. And um, if you just look, if you isolate the and, and isolation, this, this compound here, there's super, many, many serious centers. And it's not possible to predict or to, to determine the stereochemistry just by isolation and normal NMR studies. 
what we do then is we, uh, in these cases, we need the biosynthetic gene cluster. And from the prediction of um, this gene cluster, it's possible to draw at least the first, um, the most likely guess or the most likely um, stereochemistry for each of those um, units. Um, because we have now so much genetic information that we, um, with uh, bio biochemical verifications, that we can predict it. And with this prediction, you start to match the NMR data. And if the prediction does not match your NMR, um, um, basically elucidation or deduction of the stereochemistry, you will need to um, modify the compound or you will need to um, do some other measures like CD measurements or crystallization to verify that. Or you do biosynthetic studies to check if your prediction is right. And in this case, it's a combination of both, but it's still the most likely candidate. It's not that we verified it because this one is so unstable that it will stand any crystallization. It just decomposes and cyclizes. Um, but the genetic information was so for, for, from so good quality that this is our most likely candidate and it's I would say about 90% true, most likely. <laughs> In this case, for example, we could crystallize it. That's far easier once you have crystals. Uh, in this case, we have ECD, so circular dichronism calculations and measurements, which matched. Uh, and then it's much easier to deduce. So in most cases, we try to gather any analytical and any biosynthetic information. And if it doesn't match, then we have to really state it's not conclusive yet. Yeah. I hope and that answers the question. Uh, uh, crystal structures of these compounds for reducing? Of, of this one, of derivatives we have, uh, of this one we have, which is not published, but we have it now. Um, for this one, we only have ECD structures, also uh, CD uh, measurements and calculations. Um, and for compounds, which I have not shown here, we also have crystal structures, but it's luck. Crystallization is sometimes luck. <laughs> so and if you are lucky, it's good. But if it's if you're unlucky, then well, <laughs> nothing you can do. <laughs> Thank you. Uh. Selma, do you have any questions? Yeah, hi, Christine. Uh, nice talk. Thank you. So uh, I have just a couple of places I have questions. So in most of the cases, you are using some chiral uh, starting material, either chiral sulfonamine or aldimine. Yeah. So did you try any catalytic approach like, you know, asymmetric dihydroxylation or amino hydroxylation where you can get this uh, alpha dihydroxyl uh, and also because with ADMIX, beta and alpha, we have a lot of variations. So, did you try something? Because in some places, your analogs you can make. Have you ever tried? Um, not the ones I've shown. So, we discussed it for uh, another compound which we are synthesizing right now, which I didn't show. Um, and actually, one student is trying the chiral pool approach, and the other one is trying the amino hydroxylation approach. Um, we have to try both because the, get, the aim is to get the compound um, and we'll see. So if it's feasible and um, let's say in the same time frame, yes, but we are not a group which does methodology development because that would be too too much of all. Um, then we really rely on development from other groups. Um, so in that sense, we keep it small with development. <laughs> but if it's feasible and in the time frame, then yes. Um, but it's really um, project dependent, I would say. And in, in these cases, it was really where we said we need that one for bioassays, we need it for testing. So the aim was as quickly as possible, even if there are some drawbacks in the yields. That's a trade off. Yeah. yeah. So in this aldimine chemistry, uh, what was the selectivity? Of the tartaric acid, so it was actually 95 to 5. Uh, you could okay. easily separate it on column, so um, that was surprisingly 
Um, but we were not the first one to report the selectivity. So Baran also showed the selectivity. For example, here, uh, the, the minority you can uh, remove by column chromatography. And Baran showed it not on this derivatives, but on tartaric acid uh, analogs. Um, and he showed similar selectivities. And um, as they are diastereomers, you can separate them. Yeah, but for for this other one, we actually had crystal structures um, of the intermediates uh, because this one was not reported, and we of course we had a good guess what uh, the diastereomer is you get out, um, but we verified it by crystallography at the end, yeah. okay. just to make so, sure that so, you're not so, on the wrong track. Oh. So isn't tertiary metal all the element sulfur? R group, uh, what is the R group in the aldimin? As a mesotyl. Mesotyl. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But it works also for others, but this one was the easiest one. Okay. Yeah. So how, how do you purify this uh, spongy of uh, Like you have amine and a lot of hydroxyl and acid. So use like any resin for purification or normal uh, <laughs> fine. That is a very good question. It's a horrible thing to purify. <laughs> Uh, uh, reverse phase, uh, so you need to do a reverse phase column chromatography in most cases, and then you use something like a C8, so silica gel modified with alkyl chain C8 on reverse phase column chromatography. Yeah. They are not easy to purify. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Sula. Uh, so, Sheena, I, I have a few yeah. questions. Yes. Hmm? Somebody have questions? Yeah, may I? Yes, yes. Yeah, Mish. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Christian. This is Omish. Hi. Uh, first of all, your presentation was very nice. It's work uh, because uh, you know very few people nowadays in the world, not only in India, in world working on the total synthesis actually. So yeah, it's really very really good piece <laughs> for uh, us to see this total synthesis. Yeah. Uh, just one small. Very, I have here uh, in uh, your work. Uh, yeah. Most of the time, you have this chiral pool strategy approach for your total synthesis. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just one synthetic uh, problem, uh, which I also observe in uh, total synthesis when we start with the chiral pool. What are the substrate you are taking, starting material? What are the chances, or is there any chances you or you observe somewhere uh, that preservance of that chiral center? Throughout the uh, sequence, I mean, still the last step. Have you observed somewhere little extent racemization? I'm not saying um, fully, mm -hmm. but um, you mean the racemization of starting material? Um, we at the center, that particularly any particular chiral kind of center throughout the sequence, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. fully, yet for five, ten percent or one percent like that. I mm -hmm. must say. Yeah. So. By Ga in case of Ghana aldehyde, you have to be very, very careful um, because this one racemizes uh, easily. Um, so as soon as you, tartaric acid is uh, fine, uh, also the coupling reaction, because the, the coupling is so fast that there's nothing rotating or happening and you have fixed it here with a protecting group. But in case of Ghana aldehyde, you have to be very, very careful. Um, so there um, you have to check that you really get the right diastereomere out of at the end. So after the addition, um, let's say here. Um, and for example, what we also not no, this. This one is also not that straightforward. Uh, this derivative this also racemizes very easily. But um, one second. Um, now I'm a little bit um, here. Yeah, this is also not the case here. Um, so, for example, this version with the Bock version is stable, okay, but you should not column chromatography. You should just either distill it quickly or even use it once you have made the Ghana aldehyde. Um, but for example, we, we tried uh, the cysteine derivative where you have here sulfur, and that caused a lot of problems. Not only for racemization, but also um, interacting with the Bock group, oxidizing, and so on. And here we would not, because that could be a question why don't you start already with the sulfur here? 
And it's because any cipher derivative really causes problems in any of the subsequent steps. Um, and then uh, you have issues that you have to purify it one more time, and then you rasmize positions. Um, that is, was not successful at the end. So we always had to introduce the cipher using substitution reactions. If that kind of addresses the question. Our uh, formalic acid derivatives or tartaric acid, that is fine. They, we didn't observe any problems or diastereum as which showed up at one point. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah, Christina, I have a few questions. Since uh, most of the intermediates and the final products do not have any chromophores, so how do you, uh, the students identify by Chromatography, yeah. do they run always LCMs? Yeah. Uh, they were crying, no. <laughs> uh, we, they have some absorption uh, to 190, um, which is you can use. Um, we had a refraction index um, on the HPLC, so you could see refraction index changes. That works. And we also had a detector for conductivity. So especially once you have a sulfono group, um, this changes conductivity, and then you can basically use that as a sensor. So um, I think the different sensors help. So, but you're right. So these lipids they absorb at 190 max, <laughs> maybe at 210. Uh, so you need larger uh, amounts to see signals in the HPLC. Yeah. It's yeah. also for purification, it's a nightmare. Um, yeah. But in, as I said, so refraction index and conductivity helps sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so mostly purifications are done by HPLC, reverse phase HPLC. Yeah, at least for the more final compounds, uh, for, for the natural products anyways, and for the more final compounds as well. I mean, if you are in a preparative scale, of course, then you just stain um, from normal column chromatography, and you stain the compounds. But as soon as you get more complex, we normally go via HPLC. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. So any other questions from anybody? Students? Yeah, I have a couple uh, just quick questions regarding the protection used for with the boron trichloride. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I cannot tell you so, what all did not work because it was a very long list which did not work. <laughs> yeah, so only the boron trichloride or some other boronating agents also you have tried? Uh, yeah, Luca tried other boronic acid, but the problem is you have to balance uh, the reactivity um, versus the uh, rate of deprotection, because mm -hmm. his goal or he wanted to really keep the acetyl group at this position. And of course, you can deprotect using other reagents and also other boron reagents, but then you also get rid of the acetyl group. Um, so you had here to make a temperature uh, controlled, uh, really temperature and time control to get it actually to this compound. And that's why the yield are very moderate, but then you have it on this position. And this was a long question, if it's really on the O acyl or N acyl, um, which one is a natural product? And this one is certainly the natural product, whereas this, once you keep that one, even in an NMR tube for overnight, you already mm -hmm. see the migration uh, to the N to the N acyl group. So um, you see then showing up two spots at the end um, of a mixture. And if you heat it up, then it of course goes faster. Um, yeah, so that was the aim. And this one gave the best balance. Um, but of course, you can fully deprotect, you can use also other strategies or even acid. Okay, thank you. Because I was just thinking like whether I have tried with this BVR3 because BCL3 you are using it like solutions with something or like a ethereal it solution is, but or something. Then yeah. it, yes, but it, again, then you have two, the, the acetyl group is cleaved off too fast. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
It's, okay. Uh, I cannot mm -hmm. explain fully why this is the. I, but I guess it's mm -hmm. a question of moderate activity versus still being active enough to cleave off everything else. You can also ad selectively address each of the protecting groups, but then the other remain. And that is not helpful <laughs> because we want to get rid of That's all of true. those. <laughs> so if you want, you can cleave off the acetyl group selectively or this one. Um, if you use less reactive reagent or less time, then you can stop it in between. But if you want to get rid of all three, this was kind of the balance. Yeah, but I have no, yeah, okay. yeah, but I have no, say, I cannot show you any mechanism and that's what what's likely happening. Really don't know. So, uh, okay. Christina, you used uh, Grab's second generation catalyst, whereas uh, alkenes are mainly mono substituted. Uh, so, is the reaction failed with Grab's one? So, you have to shift to Grab's two? Um, I don't think that we ever tried Grab's one. Um, I would have to check actually, because I think we used just the same conditions more or less like for the other synthetic approaches mm -hmm. but i would have to ask actually because if he did it he might not have told me <laughs> but then it didn't work <laughs> so uh, that could could have been the case that he tried it but he didn't tell me because yeah if the yields were lower and they are already low so <laughs> yeah yeah okay. but it's the problem is also the coordination to the catalyst. So uh, I think it's, I was surprised that it worked at all uh, at the end because you have too many coordination sites actually mm -hmm. to interact with the catalyst. And for this one, always, actually in all cases, you have to add it uh, subsequently. So one charge, the next one, wait a little bit and add it again because the catalyst deactivates too quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not helping to steer it for like 12 hours with one charge, but you really have to like make small portions out of it and then add it subsequently. So maybe uh, maybe the catalyst is added by micro syringe methods. Actually, it's just spatula under argon. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. I I'm not sure if it really if it's good if you keep it in a solution. In that case, it's just spatula, and then you just add it. You just rate your whatever milligram you want to add, in, and then you always add a little bit to it. Okay, yeah. So, any other questions? Anybody have any questions? Students? So you can contact me otherwise if you have <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah, I think. Yeah, I think there are no more questions. Uh, so, Adip. Yeah, I think there are no more questions. We can. Uh, yeah. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, okay, you probably. can close it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Christian. So for your wonderful talk and being a part of this Acharya Prabhupada lecture series. And it was nice and wonderful experience for all of us to listen to you and your talk. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. I think uh, we can go for the like, interactions. So. Mm -hmm. Students who I, I, need, here, I think you can go. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I need one minute. I need to check on my son. He's doing some very crazy thing, and I'm just here in the background that he's doing something. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> I'm I'm back in a minute. Yeah, sure. Uh, Nitin. Hello, Nitin. Ah, tum YouTube abhi ek kar lo. Check, check. Uh, Dr. Amrindra, maybe you can start with your yeah, students. You can 